So as we're going forward, we're, we might be referencing or seeing in papers or, or, or guest speakers or what have you, some of these terms, <laughs> and I've not yet defined these things for you, so I want to take a couple minutes here and just define, make sure we're all on the same page uh, with the, uh, the terminology here. So here is an exaggerated cross-section of the ocean. It doesn't look like this, right? We've sort of shoved it side to side, squeezed it together from the sides. So we're exaggerating the up and the down for explanation purposes. You and I are up here by the E in exaggerated. So that's the, the terrestrial side of things. That's the land, right? We obviously are all on a tectonic plate, a continental plate. And that area is essentially the same. The, the near shore underwater is basically the same as the uh, near shore parts of the coast in the air, right? So it's a continuation. If sea levels go up, if sea levels go down. We'll see more canyons or less canyons, but, but it's you know, the same kind of thing. So if we look there, the, the general slope, the, the, the shape of the land more or less continues underwater as it, as it is uh, shaped above water. And so that's going to go, and now it's going to depend on what continent we are and, and, and where we are exactly in the world, but generally it's going to go off for some period of time. It's going to extend out underwater. And then we get to this uh, uh, sharp change. Up to that point, we refer to these areas as the continental shelf. So the, all the, the reefs and the biota and all that kind of stuff are on the continental shelf. Then we enter this pretty steep drop off, right? And so this is a much steeper angle, regardless of how steep this continental shelf is, the continental slope is steeper than any continental shelf. So it's a much more significant drop off. We refer to that as the continental slope. And that's going to go down for a long ways. And just like any mountain or hillside that has been there for a while, uh, you're going to get rubble. You're going to get debris. Um, Matt was flying, was mapping a, a beach this week, and part of the sea cliff eroded onto this guy's surfboard, right? So that, those kind of processes go on, whether it's, whether it's on land or underwater. And so essentially, this stuff piles up here. And we see the rise is a, is a change. So this, this continental slope is more or less a continuous uh, even degree, even angle of drop off. And it goes for you know, a long ways. And you're just going down, going down, going down. And then you hit what amounts to the toe of this hillside or mountainside. And we call this the continental rise. And so this is signaling that we're sh shifting the geomorphology. And then we hit the bottom of the ocean, which we refer to, uh, refer to as the abyssal plain. And this abyssal plain is broad. This is most of the ocean, or, or the, the um, uh, sediments, the rocks, et cetera, on, that cover the world ocean, most of them are in the form of an abyssal plain. So a broad, flat uh, area. In different places, this abyssal plain is rent open, is, is, is cut open, if you will. It's like from a... From a mapping perspective, it looks like someone took a, uh, a razor blade and sort of cut it open type thing. So that would be an, a, a trench, a deep sea trench or an oceanic trench. Uh, and if you recall, the, the deepest of that is uh, the Marianas Trench, and the deepest part of that trench is the Challenger Deep. Um, but we have trenches in various places. They're not only in, in the Marianas Islands, near the Marianas Islands. Also punctuated that that abyssal plain is volcanoes, volcanic activity. And so that's what we're, that's what we're illustrating here. So the classic example would be something like the Hawaiian Islands, right? So, so oceanic trench is much deeper than the surrounding abyssal plain. Volcanic islands much shallower than the surrounding abyssal plain. We also have some of these things like submarine ridges, which are also created by tectonic activity. Um, 
we it's not not shown on this diagram, but also we have, uh, for example, coral reefs and atolls, things of that nature. Most of those were also created similarly by volcanic action, wherein the volcano part, the rock part, is eroded, and the life has picked up, and the life has has grown up, and and maintained that structure near the surface waters uh, by by laying down their calcium carbonate skeletons. Does that make sense? So we have continental shelf, continental slope, the rise, and the abyssal plain. And that abyssal plain is punctuated by volcanoes and ridges and then trenches. Make sense? All right, cool. Um, I just told you guys this. So, uh, yeah, right. So this is, this is a, it's hard to find a nice image that is that I really like. I'm, I'm always constantly searching it. I don't really, I've never really found one I particularly like, but this is the East Coast. And this one is, is particularly good in the sense that I think it provides a nice sort of perspective here, all this stuff together where we have these continental shelves. We have this, right, the, the drop off of the shelf, the slope. We have the, the, the toe or the, ri the rise sort of illustrated quite well. And then most of this is this abyssal plain that's punctuated here and there by different different uh, ups and downs of a volcano or a trench. I should note that uh, off the East Coast, Old Coast, there is no um, coming together of plates or anything near, near New York or New Jersey or anything like that. So they have a very broad, flat continental shelf. Here on the West Coast, we have very little continental shelf compared to those areas. And for us, we're much more up down because we're much more of a baby coast. We're much more of a geologically young coast that is not eroded. So we're more up down. This is a much more uh, weathered uh, series of geological features on, on areas uh, such as the Eastern Seaboard. Cool? Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about are different uh, location terms for these regions of the ocean. Pelagic, neuritic. Pelagic is off out there. Pelagic is away from any land. Neuritic, uh, actually, so let, me, let me step back, let me step back. Okay, so let's, let, let's talk about, here we are again, let's start on land again. So you and I typically refer to this as the wetland, the shrubland, the, you know, whatever. Um, in the context of ocean regions, we would refer to that as, uh, the term you're most useful, or excuse me, most used to is the intertidal, right? The area between the tides, between the highest highs and the lowest lows, right? So the intertidal, that makes sense. From a perspective of the ocean, uh, people would refer to the land as supratidal, meaning above the highest high tide. Okay, so that's, so we're starting there. Uh, then we get down into the uh, nearshore systems. Uh, so anything of or relating to the coast, anything near the coast, this could be the land, the terrestrial stuff that's near the coast, or it could be the wet part of the coast that's near the land, is, is coastal. And we use the term littoral for that. So littoral is of or relating to the, to the coast. Neuritic refers to being near to a continent, near to land. Oceanic being far from land. Okay, another contrasting term, series of terms would be pelagic versus benthic. Benthic is of or related to the bottom or an edge, a surface. Typically, we think of it being the bottom. Um, however, uh, invasive species that have attached to the bottom of a hull, those are benthic Those are benthic critters, right? Even though they're not attached to the natural bottom, they're attached to a bottom. So benth a benthic or benthos is stuff on the bottom, and pelagic is stuff up in the water column. Going, oh, actually, let me leave that. So going farther down into the, um, going farther down into the water. So we started super tidal above the tides. Then we get the intertidal, right, which is the area between 
the highest high and lowest low. Then we get to the subtitle, sometimes referred to as the shallow subtitle for overemphasis. So that would be the kind of stuff where you and I could throw a scuba tank on and we jump in the water, and that's, that's sort of the area that we have access to, the, the, the area that is, is nearby. If we, go far, if we go farther, there's different terms people use that just have to do with how deep we're going. So bathal, abyssal, hadal. Hadal is like Hades, right? That's like the deepest of the deep. That's, you know, the, the trenches. We say are hadal depths. depths. Um, but more important, I want you to focus on this right here, which is the photic zone and the non-photic or aphotic zone. So this, there's a... A not, not super clear definition. Different people have different definitions and ultimately depends on what critter we're really talking about, typically. But the photic zone is the area where photons of light penetrate. So you can think of it where we, we can see stuff with our eyeballs. <coughs> the shallowest area is where we have the most photons and therefore the most photosynthesis and therefore the most primary productivity from the sun. As we start to go deeper, it gets harder and harder, and as we'll, we'll hear about in a second, um, the uh, light doesn't all go, doesn't, doesn't uh, penetrate the ocean equally. So, so, so not only are we getting fewer and fewer photons, the wavelength, that the energy that, those, that that light possesses changes as we go down into the ocean. So the photic is the lit area, the aphotic is the dark area. Now this is location terms. Make sense? Pelagic, benthic, right? Neuritic, oceanic. Is that cool? Okay, then we can use um, place-based general terms for critters. Now you've probably heard of plankton, right? We've already talked about some of these, these harmful algal blooms and I've referenced plankton. But let's start with nuston. So nuston are critters that are at the surface. So again, these terms I'm giving you are things that describe where the organisms typically live or organisms that are common inhabitants of this area. So this doesn't have anything to do with their taxonomic uh, 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 organization, right? This is, this is place-based terminology. So nuston, critters living right up near the surface, either exactly on the surface, something like a Portuguese man of war that's literally floating with part of its body in the air and part of its body in the water, or just somebody that, or just an organism that lives very, very close to the, to the skin of the ocean. Uh, excellent question. Uh, no. So, okay, well, these terms could apply to anything. Yes, you're correct. But, um, no, M mammals are probably going to be considered necton. So we'll get to that in a second. So nuston would be something like a... Uh, nuston would be something like a larval fish that needs to stay in the, in the super shallow, in, in immediate shallow surface. Nuston would be something like sargassum, floating sargassum, something like that. Uh, baby crabs could, yeah, again, if, they, if, if they're a species that stays very, very tight to the surface, yes. So an example would be pelagic red crabs that we have that uh, typically aggregate the surface. We get those typically during an El Nino year, but, but yeah, could be. So the, let's get to the next ones, and it might make more sense. So the next two um, apply to things anywhere in the water column. So nuston is associated with the skin. These next two terms mean the critters are anywhere in the volume of water. Okay, so they could be shallow, they could be deep, doesn't matter. Plankton and nekton. Plankton is a term for generally small things, but they don't have to be small. Uh, uh, they could be larger things, such as um, giant salps or, or siphonophores or things of this nature. So plankton basically means that much of the movement of this critter is dictated by the currents and the tides and the water moving around. Most plankton can exert gazuntag. So when I was when I was your guys' age, or or yeah, I guess when I was your guys' age, so the thought there was originally that plankton 
didn't do much. So plankton were completely at the whim of the currents, 100% at the whim. They just are pass passive things. We now know that plankton can exert control. How they swim, whip their little flagella or whatever it is, they can actually exert some control and they can try to be in an area where the currents are gonna blow them east or west or something like that. But, but by and large, on a, on a minute by minute scale, okay, plankton are moving with the water column. Now, so you guys have most commonly heard of phytoplankton or photosynthetic plankton or zooplankton, the, the um, heterotrophic plankton that are eating other things, but both are plankton. That would be contrasted with nekton. So nekton are things like fish, whales, uh, great white sharks, uh, giant squid. So those guys, they might be in a current and the current might be helping them swim, but if they want to go up, they can move against that current, right? Should they so choose, a tuna, let's say. And then we have benthic critters or, 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 or critters living in the benthos. So those can be living right on the surface, which we call epi, epibenthos or, or, the, or epibions, or um, folks that are living inside the sediment, so worms and things like that. So we have nuston up near the skin, um, benthos critters living at the bottom, and then in, in, in the water column, critters are either dictated by, by and large, how the currents are moving, that's plankton, and then critters that are exerting their own choice where they want to swim um, and can easily defeat those currents with fins and, and, uh, and wings and things of that nature, and that would be nekton. Make sense? Cool, so we have, we have place-based name, we, we have location-based names, and then we have names for organisms based on where they are in the ocean system. So an organism that resides in the sand, so in metabolism, would that be considered nuston or benthos? Benthic, but benthos. Because it's in the sand. Yep. Yep. It's not about the depth. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, All right. Be like corals, and stuff. corals would be part of the benthos. Well, let me take that back. Adult corals would be part of the benthos, but they have planular larvae, and so they release their larvae. So when they release their larvae, that they, they spend part of their life in the plankton. And then, and then, so that could be a few minutes, that could be a few hours, it could be a few days, we just can depend on the species. And then whenever they settle, they'll undergo a, a, a metamorphosis and they'll become an attached critter. At that point, they would, be, they would join the benthos. So that's a good point. So, so depending on life history and, and developmental stage, an organism could potentially spend their life theoretically in all of these different, in all of these different phases. Cool, good question. Others? All right, great, awesome.